Get ready to rumble. Chilling Show Unleashed on the Seven Thunders Media Network. Former city councilor, husband, father, and community watchdog. Your host, Rob Schilling. Welcome to the Shilling Show Unleashed podcast. Remember, your direct support makes our show possible, and you can directly support this podcast by visiting shillingshow.com and then clicking on the Patreon banner at the top of the page to make a monthly contribution. We appreciate your support. The Shilling Show Unleashed podcast welcomes Austin Roos, author of Under Siege, No Finer Time to Be a Faithful Catholic, and president of the Center for Family and Human Rights. Today's topic is Christian Values Under Siege. It's a desperate situation in America. And Austin, welcome to the Shilling Show Unleashed podcast. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I want to start here because I think it's most important for us to understand the foundation of our morality. And sadly, in America, many people are detached from that. So where would you put the foundation of American morality? I mean, we are a Christian nation. We were founded by Christians, you know, even though we have this thing that they consider to be separation of church and state, we were founded by Christians. Uh, we remain a Christian country, even uh, even though we do not have a, a Christian, a quote-unquote Christian government. As a matter of fact, in my book, I argue we, we now have an official state religion, which is not Christianity and quite hostile to Christianity. But the values um, in this country are deeply uh, based in uh, in the Bible uh, in uh, Rome, in Jerusalem, in Athens. Um, it, is, it is the Western canon. So we have this, and then we need to link that and that foundation to the success and prosperity of our nation over the years, because I don't think that's a coincidence that this has been the most prosperous and successful nation in history, and the fact that we have the foundation you just referenced. I would agree with that. If that's the case, then we're under attack right now because we see the uh, morality of the nation crumbling underneath us. So what do you make of the attack? Who's on the attack and why? Well, you know, the sexual revolution is is on the attack. And the sexual revolution really began, well, in the Garden of Eden. But uh, in in more recent days, uh, the French Revolution that saw that uh, the family and the church were the principal enemies of what they consider to be freedom and what we consider to be license. And this has just gained steam over the years and uh, has gained steam exponentially since the 1960s with, you know, kicking prayer out of, uh, out of schools and kicking the Bible out of schools and the institution, uh, the, the invention and the widespread availability of the pill, um, which, which, uh, and the explosion of pornography um, the literal explosion of no-fault divorce, which swept the country in just a couple of years, that have really sundered you know, the, the foundational institution of this country, which is the family. And why? Because um, you know, they think that um, they're, they're never going to be happy and they're never going to be free until they're free of the constraints uh, placed upon them by the church and the family. So, uh, they, 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 and, but what we know is, is that that kind of sexual libertinism only ever leads to heartbreak and sorrow and never to happiness. Yeah, it's a really good point, Austin. And you mentioned the birth control pill. We don't even talk about that anymore. That was a conversation we've had in previous decades. It's just de facto now. But at the time, people were saying, well, this, as you just referenced, will lead to freedom and happiness, and we will no longer be bound by these morals. And yet it all went wrong, didn't it? Well, you know, yeah, it, it, it did. Uh, I mean, the pill, you, you can trace most of society's ills today back to the pill, um, including, you know, things like Black Lives Matter and the riots in the cities, because those those kids uh, who you know were burning down American cities last summer um, are seeking identity where they used to find identity in the family, even the extended family, you know uh, cousins and aunts and uncles and grandparents um, that has all been taken away from them, and there is a rage among them because it has been taken away from them and and therefore they seek identity in the color of their skin in in their tribe, in their gang. 
Um, and so they used to have an identity that was rooted in the family and that's been taken away and, uh, and all hell follows. Well, we've certainly seen it. I want to go to this most recent Gallup poll on LGBTQ plus identity. And I saw the number a uh, record 7.1% of Americans now identifying like this. How does that compare historically? You know, the question of identity is a funny thing. Um, you know, the, the expanded numbers these days, I think, has a lot to do not with actual identity and even with, uh, you know, actual behavior. Um, but it has a lot to do with fashion um, that, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm LGBT, too. I'm, I'm non-binary. They'll, they'll say I'm non-binary. But, you know, they'll only, you know, they'll only boys will say I'm non-binary, but they'll only go with girls. So these are such broad categories that they can fit themselves into as a new kind of identity that's that's fashionable. Um, so I, I, I question these numbers um, beyond considering that that they are fashion. Um, the most robust study of homosexuality in America was uh, done by the, uh, the the National Institute of Health, the CDC, now less than a decade ago, that showed that uh, uh, homosexuals are no more than 1.6% of the population. Um, you know, there, there are more Methodists in this country than, uh, than, than, than homosexuals. Uh, there are probably more ex-gays than there are uh, active gays. So it, it's, it's a part of their success in that they have put it in people's minds that they are everywhere and that anybody could be this. And everybody probably is this. Everybody is, you know, somehow, you know, poly, poly, polyamorously perverse. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a little bit of a marketing campaign that they've been quite successful at, but when push comes to shove, um, I, I think that, uh, most, most of these kids are, are not non-binary or transgender or whatever, as long as they don't begin taking puberty blockers, as long as they don't start lopping off healthy, uh, tissue, um, then I think that it, it's quite possible that these people will move beyond th these childish things. Uh, we did a call, we did a panel at the UN a few years ago on, on gender issues. And there was a young man that was there who was dressed. Oh, like I am right now in jeans and a shirt and, and mm -hmm. regular haircut. And he was wearing dangly earrings. And I said, I, I said, what are, what are you? And he said, I'm non-binary. And the, the thought occurred to me then that he's going to have some great pictures to show his kids, <laughs> to show how wacky he was in his twenties, just like his dad was probably wacky, you know, in the seventies or eighties, maybe his dad was a punk, you know, and th th these, these are, these are the ways of young people. And, and hopefully it, it won't be made permanent by drugs and surgery. Yeah, I want to go down that road a little further. And I do also want to clarify the numbers because the number for Gen Z is 21%. And it's probably what you were thinking of that's much higher. Yeah, that's right. And, and that's, that, right. that's a disturbing number. I do want to go to the topic of surgeries and drugs for kids. Now, in a not too long ago generation, uh, this would have been considered child abuse. What has changed? Well, the ascendancy of, of the sexual revolution, um, you know, that, that's precisely what's changed. You know, they, they say that the science shows us that, uh, that you know, that, that sex is assigned at birth, um, that it's, it's, not a, it's not a permanent thing, uh, and it can be changed. Um, so what has changed is the ascendancy of the sexual revolution that has taken over all institutions, including, quote unquote, science, including a, a, even medicine. So, you know, you're, you're now considered to be a hater if, if you say that, you know, boys are boys and girls are girls. Um, so, yeah, so all of this is tied back to the ascendancy of the sexual revolution and the sexual revolutionaries have the whip hand and, and they are not shy about using it. Do you see a push? And it seems to me there was at least one state that was considering legislation to uh, consider these things on children as abuse and that the parents and medical establishment would be punished for doing them. Do you see any movement in America going back to that sort of a mentality? Well, I think one state, and I'm just looking here on the internet, that one state, uh, I think just passed a law that yes. said that minor children cannot get, get surgery. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that there, there are some efforts along these lines, you know, that there are efforts to, to ensure that, um, that uh, minors are not are not mutilated. There are pushbacks uh, against uh, boys uh, competing with girls in, in, in sports. Um, there are efforts in a couple of states 
to say that, you know, non-traditional sexual relationships cannot be taught to uh, children in grade school. In my own state, there there was a law that was passed that, that said that uh, uh, sexually explicit material cannot be shown to children in schools um, here in Virginia uh, without the approval uh, of, of parents. So there is a lot of pushback. You know, um, the, 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 um, the development of critical race theory and the galvanization of thousands of moms and dads across this country uh, ha- has been uh, a godsend to, uh, you know, to good sense. Um, and, and it's happening all over the country. And, and the, the pushback against c- critical race theory is now tied pretty closely to the LGBT issue. So you have the same moms and dads uh, complaining about CRT, complaining about LGBT message on their kids, complaining about masking. So this is all tied together. There's a revolution among, among parents that is happening coast to coast. And yet people are not aware of these connections. I had a screen capture of the Black Lives Matter webpage, which was specifically promoting LGBTQ ideology and uh, the destruction of the nuclear God-ordained family. And of course, they took that down very quickly, but I caught it. But most people don't know that. Are they trying to keep it a secret? Because at one time it was on their website. Well, you know, um, they, they uh, you know, I, I don't know what motivates them, but I am aware that that kind of stuff was up on their website and they took it down. Uh, clearly, they, they see it as a hot potato. I want to get into the schools and the government schools have been complicit in all of this. And you mentioned the law passed here in Virginia, which I've been following for a couple of years. This actually passed and was turned down by one of our previous governors, Governor McCall, if it landed yeah. on his desk and he vetoed it. But why would the schools see this is what why I scratch my head and I agree with this law. But why would the schools in the first place be promoting sexually explicit material to children? Well, it's the sexual revolution. I mean, they believe that um, that waking kids up to all kinds of sexual experiences and possibilities is uh, is good for their uh, their their moral um, education. Uh, I mean, we have to take them at their word that they believe this is, this is a good thing that that children read this kind of material um, because you know they're going to be faced with this as they as they grow older. But I mean, what we know is that this is really indoctrination. It's a kind of grooming um, that that uh, you know I, I I think a lot of these people are truly perverted individuals who have invaded our schools. But I mean, uh, you know, I, I we can question their motives. I think that part of it is grooming. I think that others think. Well, golly, it's just a good idea for them to know what what the world is really all about. And this is one of the this is one of the realities of the real world is uh, is, uh, you know, uh, uh, human sexuality. I'm thinking that it's probably a good idea for parents to get their kids out of government schools altogether. If this is the battle that's being fought and, you know, once a kid's exposed, Austin, to this information, it doesn't leave their mind. I would ask you, uh, should parents put their kids in parochial schools, private schools, home schools, and not even risk this? Because it seems like you're gambling a lot. Uh, well, my wife and I determined a long time ago when, when our children first came that they would never go to government schools. Mm-hmm. And so we've sacrificed a great deal to send them uh, through private uh, schools, um, faithful Catholic schools, um, from the very beginning of their education, they've never gone to a public school. Um, they, they, they started out in a, uh, uh, our parish school, which is a Catholic Montessori school. And, and now they're in, uh, 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 an Opus Dei, uh, middle school, high school here in Virginia. And, uh, yeah. And, and we, uh, you know, and but, uh, you cannot send a kid to just to any private school or to any, uh, uh, private religious school because they could be all wrong too. So you, you have to investigate very closely where you're sending your kids. We are confident that our children are in a place where most of the parents, overwhelmingly the parents are on mission as we are. And so are the teachers and, and the administration, but that's not a slam dunk. Um, you know, if, if you're going to pull your kids out of public school and you should, you, you really have to look carefully about where you're going to send them. Homeschooling is great. I like the fact that homeschooling is, is exploding. Uh, uh, so that there's a huge homeschooling community here in, in, in Northern Virginia, and there are pockets of it all over the country. It's, it's a really remarkable uh, development. The Shilling Show Unleashed podcast with Austin Ruse continues in just a moment. Enjoy the revolution. 
online at shillingshow.com. Borderhawk.news is a one-stop shop with the latest news about immigration, nationalism, and globalism. The Borderhawk staff daily curates immigration news stories and in the fashion of the Drudge Report, updates the site with cutting-edge content and original first-class commentary. Borderhawk.news highlights national and international media reports, tweets, and nuggets buried in local news blurbs, polls, video clips, and policy research. Borderhawk is pro-legal immigration, pro-rule of law, but against an unsecure border as countless Americans have suffered violence at the hands of criminal illegal aliens. And an increasing number of Americans are concerned about how mass migration affects their daily life. Borderhawk.news will remain on the forefront of the immigration issue with a buffet of info to read, evaluate, and share. Bookmark Borderhawk.news. Add them on social media at Borderhawk News on Twitter. Community Watchdog. We return with our guest, Austin Ruth, the Shilling Show Unleashed podcast, talking about Christian values under siege in America. I wanted to go on here to talk about keeping parents out of the loop and particularly in the topic now of pronouns, which kind of gets back to this whole identity issue. Uh, you know, the schools don't want the parents to know what is the responsibility of the parent to dig deeper? And are you concerned that kids are becoming autonomous and separated from their parents? Well, you know, this, this, this certainly is uh, the, the autonomy of children separate, separate from their parents is a very important issue going on today. In the work that I do at the United Nations, um, you know, we, we have uh, fought against the Convention on the Rights of the Child, uh, which now dates back, you know, 15 years. Um, every country in the world has ratified the, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, with the exception of the United States and I think Somalia. Um, but in there, it explicitly makes children um, uh, autonomous, rights-bearing persons quite separate from their parents. Um, and, and that really is, is, is one of the main issues today. The schools view parents as the enemy. Um, and and th- this is this is nothing new. Um, th- this has been going on for a good long while. Um, so yeah, parents are the enemy. Uh, children are quite separate. I mean, you see this with you know children who express that maybe they're a little bit different, and you know the school administration will latch onto them. They used to latch onto them and say, oh well, maybe you're homosexual, and now they're saying latching onto them, saying, oh well, maybe you're transgender, and they begin the indoctrination. And sometimes. And we hear this with greater frequency. The children will be indoctrinated without the knowledge of their parents. You know, from now on, they will say to other kids, Scotty is now going to be Susie. And they will dress Scotty in dresses behind the backs of the parents because they also think that this is, this is, this is the right thing to do. And then if parents squawk, uh, they will call Child Protective Services um, and, uh, and, and get the parents in trouble because they're standing in the way of, of Scott wanting to be Susie as if Scott can make a decision to be Susie. Um, so yeah, the, the, they are working very hard to, to get parents. Out. The, the, they're trying to crack the nut of the family, which is one of the protective shells that, uh, that human beings have to keep them away from tyranny, either from the government or from science or from social scientists or from teachers. And they have to crack the nut of the family. And they do that by going behind the parents' backs and uh, getting parents in trouble when they when they complain. I mean, just look at the fact that the Justice Department um, began investigating parents who were definitely doing nothing more than complaining to school boards about what was going on. They were viewed as domestic terrorists by the U.S. government. So, yeah, it, they absolutely want to separate, uh, make, make children quite separate from their parents and make the parents the enemy. You mentioned, Austin, the United Nations, your work there. And I've got to ask you, this push uh, for all of these strange sexual ideologies is really heavy from the United Nations. And a lot of people who aren't following closely probably don't realize that. How widespread is it and to what ends? Well, let me just say this about the United Nations. The Fairfax County School Board is more radical than the United Nations (laughs) on sexual issues. Um, uh, You know, the UN General Assembly is pretty good. Um, heck, we, we have, uh, this will shock your listeners, 
Uh, we have uh, actually a very good definition of gender in international law. It was defined in the Rome statutes creating the International Criminal Court now about 20 years ago. The definition of gender in international law is gender is men and women in the context of society. Mm. Go back a few years before that at the Beijing Women's Conference, gender is defined at, quote, as it has traditionally been understood, unquote. Mm -hmm. So so the U.N. General Assembly is not half bad on these particular issues. The Fairfax County School Board is the worst in the world. Um, Now, having said that, I will also say that the U.N. bureaucracy, the U.N. agencies, the U.N. Population Fund, uh, the U.N. Children's Fund, the World Health Organization, they're as radical as you can possibly be. And they have billions of dollars to spread this all over the world. But in terms of the, you know, what we think of as the, as the UN, that is to say the General Assembly, the General Assembly has not really gone along with this. In UN documents, sexual orientation and gender identity has only appeared two times in non-binding resolutions. It's never appeared in a treaty. Abortion has never been mentioned in a treaty. So in terms of, of our work in the General Assembly, it's not half bad. Bureaucracy is crazy but no crazier than the Fairfax County School Board. Well, that's quite an indictment of the Fairfax County School Board, and and I couldn't agree (laughs) with you more. I've been following from a distance. When people ask me when I'm out on the hustings, you know, giving talks, people say, oh, what can we do? And I say, you know what you need to do is stay home and take over the school board. I've been saying this for 15 years. You know, we've got the U.N. covered. We don't need that many people. You need to stay home and take over the school board. My wife has been working on school board issues now for many, many years. Heck, she, she was there before the CRT stuff uh, when, when they were writing uh, what they call family life education, uh, pornographic sex ed stuff in the Fairfax County School Board five, six, seven years ago. It's good to be on the cutting edge of these things because someone's got to sound the alarm. Austin, we talked about the United Nations, but the United States pushing this ideology into foreign nations. I was astounded a couple years back during the Obama administration. I took a look at the Captive Nations Week resolution, and I could hardly believe my eyes, but there was a lot of the transgender and sexual language in the Captive Nations Week resolution. So I'm kind of wondering, the United States government, particularly through the Obama administration, I'd imagine the Biden administration pushing this into foreign nations, this can't be well received in a lot of those places well you know th- there is generally a well and, and quite frankly even during the trump administration you know under under rick grinnell mm. who is somebody i've known for 25 years um you know he he was u.s ambassador to germany um and then he was for a short time the head of the nsa i mean his number one priority was pushing the lgbt agenda on countries around the world who didn't necessarily want it one of the great engines of of the sexual revolution around the world is is uh, the U.S. Agency for International Development. And these guys do this no matter who's in the White House. Um, so, yes, under the Obama administration, there, there were particular guidelines on, on gender that were issued through USAID. Um, we fought them during the Trump administration and, and won a reprieve, but it wasn't easy. And then they came back with a vengeance under, uh, under, under Biden. And there's a new guidance uh, out from USAID that says, that uh, the terms mother and father are offensive, for instance, mm. and this guides our funding on the ground around the world. And the, f- the, the main font of this ideology in the world is USAID, the, you know, the European Union, of course, and UN agencies. But the U.S. government is, is right there in the top of it. And I would say it's probably the same thing with abortion, that uh, we're pushing abortion around the world. And again, I'm not sure what sort of uh, foothold we're gaining in some of these countries, but I would imagine that this is uh, not well received, even though we continue to tie it to perhaps foreign aid. You know, the uh, I have to believe that the people on the ground uh, would prefer to get penicillin mm. rather than the contraceptive pill, mm. um, because you know, I mean, look at look at uh, look at uh, childbirth and 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 maternal mortality did not begin to drop in this country until the introduction of penicillin. That's what women need around the world uh, in, in childbirth is penicillin, not abortion. Um, so, so, um, so yeah, the people on the ground around the world want what we have, you know, they want good medicine, you know, um, and, and we tend to give them poison. So uh, the elites, however, go along with this. The elites, you know, want to be like their European betters. They, they, their elites want to 
you know, be like their, you know, their friends in, in, in the UN bureaucracy. But the people on the ground want basic health care, and we're not giving it to them because we're all tied up in the sexual revolution and the ideology that goes along with it. So what lies ahead for America if we continue down this path at this trajectory, Austin? Well, you know, uh, boy, that's a, that's a good question. You know, um, I, I, there has to be, well, there, there's two questions here. What, what happens within our borders and what happens around the world? And, and one hopes that there will be a true religious Christian revival in this country to push back against this. Um, I mean, it, we, we see a bright spot in, in all of these moms being awakened by CRT and and LGBT ideology in the schools. You know, I, I think that we have created several thousand Phyllis Schlafly's uh, mm-hmm. in the last year because of, the, of these ideologies. But I don't think it's going to be easy. One of the things I talk about in my book, Under Siege, No Finer Time to Be a Faithful Catholic, is uh, we, we, need to be less off, we need to be less caught up in victories and more caught up in the fact that God has put us here, and isn't this a glorious fight that he has given us? He sent the likes of us, lame, lame us, at precisely a moment of maximum danger for the family, for the church, for our country. He sent us. And so people get very discouraged because they see, you know, soft totalitarianism and all this stuff happening in the schools. Well, the answer is, Step up and do something. Go down to the school board and shake somebody's hand. Go down to the school board and make a speech. Send a check to a pro-life or pro-family group. There's something for everybody to do to fight this. And again, don't get all caught up in ones and lo- wins and losses. As T.S. Eliot said, there are no uh, one cause. There are no lost causes because there's no one causes. These fights began in the Garden of Eden, and they will go, yea, unto the end of time. It's a perfect perspective. Austin Roos, if people want to be in touch with you, get a copy of your book, how can they do that? Uh, my, my, I've got four books uh, that are available at Amazon. Uh, one is uh, Little Suffering Souls, uh, Children Whose Short Lives Point Us to Christ, was my first book, uh, which tells the story of young children who suffered greatly, died young, and brought many people to the church. Uh, pretty powerful stories. Uh, my second book is Fake Science, where I look at certain scientific claims made by the left and destroy them. Um, and then uh, my third book was The Catholic Case for Trump, um, which is still needed because you know what? He's going to run again. Um, and then my last book out last summer, Under Siege, No Finer Time to Be a Faithful Catholic, all available at Amazon. And in terms of CFAM, you can go to c-fam.org, c-fam.org. You can subscribe for free to our weekly report called The Friday Facts. We are on the ground at the UN every day, have been for 25 years, and we have two originally reported stories a week. Stuff that people will have no idea is going on. We tell that story. Austin Roos, thank you for being on the front lines, and thank you for joining us today on the Schilling Show Unleashed podcast. Anytime. Thanks for having me. That concludes another edition of the Schilling Show Unleashed podcast. Visit us online at shillingshow.com, where you can directly support this podcast by clicking on the Patreon banner at the top of the page and making a monthly donation. Your support is essential for the continuation of the Shilling Show Unleashed podcast. Until next time.